Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at this fascinating story of Frederick the Great. This is episode three from Extra History. If you haven't seen the first two episodes of my reaction, link is in the description that will take you back to the beginning. The link is there for the original content as well. We always want to support our original content creators. And speaking of original content, I do have a lot of original content of my own, particularly my visits to uh, historic sites, not only here in the States, but around the world. I've got another upcoming trip, a couple of upcoming trips in the works that I'll be announcing soon. But if you want to be able to see my original content without it getting mixed in with all of the reaction videos that we do here on Vlogging Through History, there is, uh, in every video that I post, we have links to my other channels. My gaming channel, which I've been back to posting daily content on the gaming channel. Uh, and then VTH Originals is where you will find all of my original content. It tends to lag a little behind what I post here on Vlogging Through History, but it's a great place to see only my original content without all of the other stuff. So I encourage you to check those other channels out. The podcast link is there. VTH Extra is there as well. So check those things out. But for now, let's dive into part three of Frederick the Great. April 11th, 1741. It's the morning after the Battle of Mulvitz. Frederick has had his first victory, and he's not happy about it. See, his general had told him to flee, that his army was about to be destroyed, so he had done so. Yet then, that same general had turned the battle around and delivered victory. Meanwhile, Frederick had wandered in the dark, nearly being captured and hiding in a house until morning. He was embarrassed, but he had learned a great deal. Mulvitz would be his school. So yeah, it's important to have those learning opportunities. And you know, in most cases, a military leader would get those learning opportunities by serving under other people and being able to learn, to grow, to rise through the ranks. But for many uh, folks, especially in royalty uh, or in some form of nobility, because remember, this is a time in history where it wasn't always about merit. You didn't start out as a lieutenant and work your way up to be a general. Typically, you had the role that you had because of who you were. Uh, you know, I know in the British government, it was very British army it was very common to be able to purchase a commission. But then you have in the 1600s during the uh, English Civil War, you have kind of the first signs of a merit-based system. But Frederick the Great is Frederick the Great. He, he's he's the king. He's Frederick the Second. Uh, and he's got his position not because of his great military leadership, but because of who he is. So he's going to have to learn in a different way. Never again would he abdicate command to another or cut his losses when victory seemed possible. His cavalry had performed poorly. He needed to do something about that. But he also saw how his advancing infantry had terrified the enemy. Huh, something to note there. And yep. though improvements did need to be made, he had his victory. He had Silesia. And he would fight to keep it for 22 years. The reason there's three Silesian Wars. Thanks so much to Ren for being a simple and effective way to help make a difference in the climate crisis. Learn more after the episode. Frederick's invasion of Silesia, on the thinnest pretenses and without even a formal declaration of war, catapulted him to international stardom. Across Europe, people scrambled to learn all they could about this rash and dynamic young king. How had a nothing power like Prussia, a scattershot part of the Holy Roman Empire, caught the mighty Habsburgs napping? That's a really good point he makes there, uh, because we think, you know, with the, the hindsight that we have now looking back from the year 2023, we think of Prussia as this great military power that dominates the German states and eventually is instrumental in not only defeating mighty France in the Franco-Prussian War, but also defeating Austria and defeating the uh, defeating Denmark and uniting Germany as this great power. Uh, but this is before all of that. So we have to keep that in mind as far as context goes. Sales of his book, The Anti-Machiavel, shot up. And his correspondence with Voltaire, written on both sides with the intention that it be shared, circulated among philosophers. When Frederick had invaded, he told his ministers that he wanted to see his name in the gazettes. And boy, did he get that. But in truth, this was not all about Frederick's enormous ego. It was also about putting Prussia on the map. When he came to the throne, Prussia was neither a fully independent kingdom nor a state in the Holy Roman Empire. It existed in the Shadowland in between. The soil was sandy and poor, its territory separated, and the population only numbered 2.2 million. 
2.2 million at a time when some of the great powers have like you know 10 20 times that many people um and again he makes another point that the fractured nature of the holy roman empire and of the german state means that some of his territory exists within the holy roman empire some of it is not uh, and so there's all these layers and complex uh you know avenues through which diplomacy needs to take place and uh he wants to eliminate all of that he wants to just make it prussia all united all connected as far as the the map goes but also connected ideologically and politically meaning forget a superpower like habsburg austria before the war prussia's biggest rival was neighboring saxony yet by invading silesia he announced that prussia was attempting to join the great nations of europe this wasn't some German state, this was a kingdom. But despite his boldness crossing the border, when he entered Silesia, most of Europe assumed Austria would crush this upstart. But then Mulwitz proved them wrong and changed everything. It exposed Austria's weakness. And if you've ever watched any of our episodes on the Siege of Vienna, or Jewish pirates, or the Thirty Years' War, you'd know that about 80% of Europe at this time was spoiling to take a swing at the Habsburgs. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, great point. Austria exists for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they're always this like big player on the world stage, right? But when it comes right down to it, they're they're like a paper tiger almost, right? It seems like everybody always thought of them as strong, but whenever they actually fought, whenever they actually got into a situation where they had to prove how strong they were. If they fought by themselves, they typically lost. And when they did win, it was only because they had great allies and other people who came to their aid or other people who fought alongside them. You don't think of a lot of situations where Austria does what, say, France does or what Germany does, where they take on multiple powers by themselves and win at times. Many in Europe, including Frederick, also fundamentally hated the idea of Maria Theresa, a woman heading one of the great powers. Not only did they not want her ruling Austria, they also wanted to break the tradition of the Habsburg line automatically being elected Holy Roman Emperor. Of course, in this case, a woman couldn't legally be elected, but Maria was pushing for her husband's election. So, sensing weakness after Mulwitz, France, Spain, Bavaria, and Saxony pounced. And thus, the First Silesian War became merely a part of the much wider War of Austrian Succession. And if all of that sounds complicated, it's because it is. Sadly, we're going to have to gloss over a bunch of stuff since this is a series about Frederick and not this unbelievably convoluted war where countries change sides faster than Lokis in the MCU. So we're going to have to dive into that at some point. I've been trying to make a list of uh, future topics I want to cover, and the War of Austrian Succession will definitely be one of those things. Uh, and occasionally I get... That brings me to an important point here. Occasionally I get people who comment and say, well, I know you only take uh, recommendations from Patreon, but can I make one anyway? That is not the case. Maybe about once a month I'll put up a vote on Patreon uh, to decide what the next reaction will be. Uh, but most of the reactions I do just come from comments from people that just say, hey, you should check this out, and then I'll check it out. Uh, so that happens a lot. So definitely if you have a, a suggestion, if you have an idea, leave it. I read every comment and I make a list of some of the ones that I want to keep in mind and go back to. But basically what you need to know is that at Mulvitz, Frederick had rung the dinner bell. Habsburg's back on the menu, boys. Get a piece while it lasts. Lord of the Rings <laughs> reference. A coalition formed around Prussia with the hope of carving up Habsburg lands in a partition. But Frederick worried that if that happened, these powers might get too powerful and overwhelm Prussia as well. Yeah. So Frederick's diplomats contacted their Austrian counterparts and cut a deal. They signed a secret truce so that both could recover strength while their troops still pretended to be at war. This is pretty brilliant stuff. And this shows that Frederick isn't a one trick pony, right? He's not just somebody who's going to go out and win on the battlefield. He knows diplomacy. He knows deception. He knows intrigue. He knows all of the important things that make a great leader. 
This lasted for a few months until Frederick, worried Maria Theresa was coming back for Silesia, reputed the treaty and joined the Allied campaign in Bohemia. So he also recognizes when the writing's on the wall and he needs to make a firm decision. But not long after Frederick arrived, the Allied march toward Vienna broke up. So turned out, it was Frederick's army that took the blow when Maria Theresa's brother-in-law, Charles of Lorraine, arrived with 30,000 troops to take the invaded territory back. And on May 17, 1742, pursuing Austrians caught half of the Prussian army. Dug in around a village to meet the Austrian attack, they were instructed to hold until the king's part of the army could arrive and take direct command. Frederick was not about to let a mere general <laughs> yeah. steal his thunder again, okay? But once he arrived, it was still a confused engagement. Frederick drove off the Austrian cavalry with a mounted charge backed by artillery, but it was a dry summer day, and soon huge banks of dust obscured any vision of the battlefield. Central command broke down. Cavalry on both sides got lost, then quit the battle to pillage the enemy baggage trains. It then became a house-to-house -house brawl of infantry and artillery through the burning town that only ended when Frederick led a huge square of 24 battalions into the Austrian flank. So to go back a second ago where he talked about the looting, uh, I don't know how much that was the case during this particular war, but for a lot of the wars of the middle part, uh, you know, the 14, 15, 1600s, the middle part of that millennia, um, the men didn't get paid particularly well if they got paid at all. Uh, in the lower ranks. And so looting became a way to make war profitable for them, to make it worth all of the effort and the, the blood, sweat, and tears and time that they put in uh, to being a part of these armies. Now, while technically a draw, the Austrians abandoned the field, giving Frederick the victory. Not to mention, diplomatically, he also won out. For so what we're talking about there, if, if you're saying it's technically a draw, but it, it's kind of a victory for him, what we're talking about is a tactical draw. And in other words, on that specific battlefield, it was a draw. There was nobody who won. But strategically, the overall situation, it's a victory. Great example of this, uh, the American Civil War. The Battle of Antietam was tactically a draw. Nobody won the Battle of Antietam, but the fact that Robert E. Lee's army had to abandon its invasion of the North and retreat back into Virginia meant that strategically it was a victory. For when the British pushed both parties to the negotiating table, Frederick once again was allowed to keep almost all of Silesia. Two months later, the First Silesian War was over. Yet he knew this was a temporary peace and that there was work to do. While the Prussian infantry was solid, the cavalry had performed poorly in both battles. So he went about restructuring and reforming his cavalry forces to be more disciplined and aggressive so they'd serve him better when Maria Theresa came for her captured province. Oh, and she was going to. In fact, Maria Theresa had flipped the script. Two years before, she'd been fighting alone against a major coalition, but now she'd set up a new anti-French alliance bankrolled by Britain. And with Russia mm. and Saxony interested in joining, Frederick worried she was about to seek revenge. So then he built a rival alliance between Prussia, Bavaria, Sweden, and two German states. So what we're seeing here is kind of a preview of the wars to come, right? You know, we're going to have the, um, the Seven Years' War, which is going to be a war of coalitions. We're going to have the Napoleonic Wars, where we're going to see a bunch of different coalitions form. Of course, then World War I, World War II, you have a system of alliances. This is kind of a glimpse of the future here with the goal of restoring the Bavarian lands taken so far in the war. France also declared its support. Then on August 15, 1744, Frederick crossed back into Bohemia, launching the Second Silesian War, which went sideways almost immediately. The campaign depended on the French tying up Charles of Lorraine and his Austrians in the West, so he couldn't return to Bohemia. But that went out the window when King Louis XV fell ill leading the French army and Charles disengaged. Then Saxony switched sides away from France and allied with Austria, meaning Prussia now had an enemy on its border. That's one of the, the really complicated parts about the fact that there are so many states that can have conflicting allegiances. It's not like in the future where you only have maybe four or five major powers that can tip the balance in Europe. You've got all of these different players who could jump from one side to the other, depending on what is going on, depending on their alliances, depending on the marriages, depending on their interests. Meanwhile, Austrian guerrilla forces hounded Frederick out of Bohemia by just savaging his supply lines. 
and realizing this was unattainable, he pulled back to defend Silesia. Things got worse. Austria formed a new alliance with Britain, Saxony, and the Dutch Republic, with secret plans to partition Prussia, the same way the powers had tried to carve up the Habsburg lands. And what's amazing to me about all this, and all this constant shifting of alliances and, and changing fortunes here, is that communication takes time, right? It's not like you have uh, you know, the ability to, to send a signal through a telegraph or pick up the phone or anything like that. These all have to be done by land communication and it takes time to negotiate these things and it takes time to set all of this up and to mobilize armies. Then Frederick's ally, the Holy Roman Emperor, dropped dead and his son made peace with Austria. And finally in May, Charles of Lorraine crossed the giant mountains into Lower Silesia leading a force of 60,000 Austrian and Hungarian troops, plus their Saxon army. allies. Frederick knew he had to act. Battle of Hohenfriedberg, June 4th, 1745, 7 a.m. Frederick told his troops to leave their campfires burning when they performed the night march. In darkness, they'd slipped out of camp and crowded across a bridge. So why do you leave your campfires burning? Because it leaves the other, other army thinking you're still there. Uh, this was actually something that was done quite often uh, throughout history and war to, to deceive an enemy at night when you don't have the ability to see what's going on. Uh, sometimes they would even have men go back and forth in front of the fires to make the enemy think that their, their army was stirring for battle, things like that. Right past the Austrian forces, for they were not the objective. Instead, Frederick wants to hit the Saxons first and destroy them before rolling up on the rest of the Austrian forces. Defeat in oh, detail. But they've been spotted. Shots ring out. Prussian and Saxon cavalry clash together in a vicious night battle. Pistol flashes light up gleaming sword blades. The Saxon camp begins to mobilize, but the infantry pushes through and the Saxon formations start to dissolve. By first light, the Saxon force is already routed and Frederick's right turns to engage the main Austrian force. Hours of gunpowder and blood follow. And the next day, Frederick sits on his horse in the courtyard of the palace he's taken as his own. He has won his greatest victory to date, and now he is honoring the troops that, more than anything, made it possible. The Bayreuth Dragoons, his heavy cavalry. At the climax of the battle, when things had still hung in the balance, they had spotted a hole in the Austrian line. And by charging through that gap, they had overrun 20 enemy battalions and wow. captured 2,500 prisoners. They'd broken the Austrians and only taken 94 casualties doing so. Dang. Now they parade their war trophies into the square. 67 battle flags of Austrian and Saxon units torn from enemy hands. There was still fighting to do, but when the king returned to Berlin, he would be doing so under a new name, Frederick the Great. Nice. All right. This is getting good. We still got a couple episodes to go. I'm excited to learn more. Go ahead and use the comment section below and share what you've learned or what more you know about the topics we just talked about. And please check out some of the links to the other channels if you would. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.